Before we start, I want to call on the acting mayor, Gord Klassen, to say a few words of welcome. Thanks, David. And uh, on behalf of uh, Her Worship, Mayor Lori Ackerman, and our council, I want to uh, welcome each one of you here to Port St. John and to this session this evening. Welcome to our guests. We are gathered, as David said, uh, here on the traditional territory of the Deneza First Nations, and it is a remarkable place, as you know, to live and to work and to play. Together, our communities are growing, and we are going strong with natural resources and hardworking people. The city of Fort St. John believes in building a resilient community with strong, sustainable industry and quality of life for the residents. To that end, we ensure that we provide opportunities for engagement with our residents online and in person. Information, we believe that information output and input is vital to getting it right. We know that not everyone will engage, but we also know that it's our responsibility to provide that opportunity early on in those processes. This process for caribou recovery has left a, a real vacuum of information for our communities, industries and residents resulting in a diminished sense of security and trust, leaving, with, uh, leaving us with an immense sense of uncertainty. And so tonight, it's, it's your role to uh, clear some of that up, to ensure that all of our questions are answered, hopefully. Without that, our input into your process is lacking due to absence of facts. And so we appreciate this opportunity to engage this evening. We look forward to the information you will provide us, as well as the opportunity for us to ask questions and to make comment. We are hopeful that our feedback will be carefully considered, that you will take the time necessary to ensure that our comments and concerns are included in the process moving forward. And so I just want to thank you again for this opportunity, thank each of you for coming, and I do look forward to a productive session this evening and a truly collaborative and inclusive process moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Mayor Klassen. Okay, uh, some more words of welcome. First of all, from uh, Canada, um, Sue Melbourne, Assistant Deputy Minister with the Canadian Wildlife Service. Sue? Hi, is that on? Can you hear me? Great. Good evening. Um, Really glad, glad to be here, and uh, on behalf of the Government of Canada, I want to thank you all for coming tonight and taking time out of your busy lives uh, over supper hour to come and talk to us about issues that are important to you. And I hope uh, to speak to some of the remarks that Mayor Claussen uh, uh, raised that we can provide you with information that, that's relevant and, and important for you, and that more importantly, we can hear from you on, on, on the on the concerns or the issues or the points that you think are important uh, that we that come up tonight. I'm here tonight uh, with a number of colleagues from Environment and Climate Change Canada because of the department's responsibility for species at risk and implementation of a federal piece of legislation called the Species at Risk Act. And I'll talk a little bit more about that act late, later on in, in the uh, uh, agenda. But caribou in BC, and indeed much of the country, are in decline. And the mountain caribou that live near here are in particularly bad shape. Indeed, last spring, the Federal Minister of the Environment, as part of her responsibilities under the Species at Risk Act, found that, there was a, that the caribou were imminently threatened to their recovery. So as a result of that, um, the, the protection and the recovery of these caribou are a key priority for uh, our minister and for the government of Canada. But another key priority and perhaps a, a, a larger uh, priority and a, a priority that uh, goes across the government of Canada is reconciliation uh, with our Indigenous people. Uh, so that's, that's a key issue and it's uh, one of the main partnership agreement that we're here to talk about uh, tonight. So 
species at risk and reconciliation are kind of the key drivers that, that, that brought us here uh, tonight. Um, I'm gonna pass the microphone on to Tom in a few minutes. Um, but uh, I, I should just also add that in addition to staff from uh, Environment Climate Change Canada, I have uh, a number of other staff uh, from uh, federal departments that provide services uh, to industry. We have existing programs for industry, for communities, and for individuals. And uh, they're here with me tonight as well. And um, so if there are any questions that come up either in the plenary session or in the, uh, the, uh, the individual sessions or the individual chats that people will have uh, during, the, the, during the break, um, you can speak to them. And I guess to do that, I'm gonna ask, uh, I'm gonna put the federal employees uh, um, on the spot and ask them just to stand up and turn around and, and identify who they are. No, no, just, just wave and say hello. You'll know that it's a federal employee. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to now pass uh, uh, the microphone. Just before, yeah, I do. So it's uh, words from um, Governor BC now. Um, will be Tom Ethier as the Assistant Deputy Minister uh, with the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resources Operations and Rural Development. Tom? Thank you, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight in Fort St. John. Uh, I look forward to the discussion that we're going to have. Uh, so, as David mentioned, I'm an Assistant Deputy Minister with the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations. I have responsibility for fish and wildlife, water, land use planning, and species at risk recovery, one of which dominates, one of which dominates most of those files is caribou. So, yes, thank you for being here. Um, we really do look forward to this discussion. Uh, we will be reviewing tonight in detail with you the partnership agreement that um, is, has been, a draft agreement has been reached between Canada, British Columbia, West Moberly, and Soto. We will also touch base on the Section 11 agreement, which is uh, a, an agreement between Canada and British Columbia that will govern how we will coordinate our recovery actions across the range of Southern Mountain Caribou in British Columbia. As Deputy Mayor mentioned, uh, it's been a long time coming, and we do regret that it's taken this, this long to get here to be in front of you. Uh, but it did take quite a while for us uh, to reach and get a stable agreement that we believe is now ready for review, input, and comment, and that's why we're here tonight. We put, we put the agreements together under the framework of reconciliation with Indigenous groups. Reconciliation is one of the key priorities of the provincial government. Indeed, advancing reconciliation is in the mandate letter of Minister Donaldson, who is my minister, and in uh, the mandate letter of each uh, cabinet minister. Within the Caribou Recovery Program, we advance reconciliation through collaboration and partnership with Indigenous groups like West Moberly and Soto. So tonight we are discussing draft agreements, and I want to emphasize they are draft. They are not final, and they need your input. We will be listening carefully, and we will take everything we hear and learn into government to inform government and advise them on their decision on this very important issue. So before I pass it on, I too would like to have the provincial staff from the various ministries that are here, Energy and Mines, Ministry of Environment, Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations, just so if you could stand up so people can kind of see who you are and if you have questions at the break or at the end of the meeting and you wanna follow up with anyone, uh, try and remember who they are. They're friendly, they're approachable, they're here to help, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Sue and Tom, for those words of welcome. So, uh, two key objectives tonight. We're gonna keep this really nice and simple. First of all, to inf and you'll, hopefully you've picked up a copy of the agenda on your way in, but to help you with that, first of all, the first part of the agenda is to inform you as much as possible on the extent and nature of these agreements, caribou recovery programs, et cetera to enable you to hopefully better understand the content of the agreements and then be able to provide us or to begin to provide us some informed output. And the way we've set the agenda up tonight is that it'll be two parts. Whoop, if I get this right here. 
going back. There we are. Okay, so first of all, as I mentioned, there'll be presentations, and you're going to hear presentations from each of the panelists, and then we're going to open it up for questions and answers. Um, then we're going to break at 7.30 for a refreshment break, and you'll probably notice throughout the, um, the room, we have a number of posters with, with lots of information. And uh, we have lots of good resource people here, so we're going to allow an opportunity for you to move throughout the room, talk to people, uh, obtain as much information, this information as you can, uh, answer these key questions to the degree you wish, and to begin to start filling out a feedback form that you'll find on the Engage BC website. And then our staff will also be helping you uh, with uh, understanding that site and be able to provide your input. As far as the evening goes, um, I think um, Acting Mayor Klassen talked about hopefully a collaborative, constructive dialogue. And so just key, see some uh, key principles um, as you move forward the, through the evening. First of all, seek first to understand the various information that's being presented to you, and then be understood to help us understand your input and provide that for as meaningfully as you possibly can. If you would like to speak or provide some input, because there are so many people in the room, we are going to have roving mics. Raise your hand. We'll get to you as quickly as we can to get your question and or input. Because there are so many people here this evening, we're hoping that you can be as succinct as possible. Try to be respectful of others because there's many people who'd probably like to speak tonight. And then as well, try to show respect, I guess, to all of us, whether we're participants or presenters. Um, you probably heard we had a session last night in Chetwin. We've had numerous conversations and meetings with people. The feedback forms are now starting to get filled out. We're starting to, to read them. And here are five uh, key messages that are already starting to be presented to us. One of them is, why so fast with the timeline? Because uh, it's taken a great deal of time to put these draft partnerships together, agreements together. So why can't we have some more time? Second one is, there is a social impact analysis being done, or being started, in terms of revenues are being developed. Um, a question around access to backcountry activities. Why is the partnership agreement just to those four parties, West Moberly, Salto, Canada, and BC? Why not just manage um, wolf populations as opposed to other sources of control or management? And people are asking for more details, more clarification on the two agreements. And remember now, we are talking about two draft agreements here. Um, Section 11 uh, of the Southern Mountain Caribou Agreement of the Species Risk Act, and the one that's more pertinent to the people here in this part of the province, the central, um, the partnership agreement with the uh, central group of the Southern Mountain Caribou. And that's what we're going to focus on mostly this evening. So what we're going to do to start off with is I'm going to ask um, Jim Webb, who's a um, policy advisor, with West Moberly First Nation to introduce to you a short video that's going to talk about and show you some of the great work that the First Nations have done with respect to caribou recovery. Jim? Good evening. The video is focused on the Klinziza Maternal Penning Project. And it features a number of West Moberly and Soto First Nation members who have spent the last five years putting together this, this recovery program and running it. So they talk for themselves in this video. And my role here is to try and give you a little bit of information about the importance of caribou recovery to the Dunaza at West Moberly and at Soto. 
they have said to both levels of government that the caribou feed them or have fed them in times of need. The caribou were a very important part of what's called their traditional seasonal round. And the caribou were always there for them up until the early 1970s when W.A.C. Bennett Dam was being constructed and Williston Reservoir was being flooded. But that dam blocked the migration route for caribou and started the decline in caribou populations. So in the early 70s, the elders at Soto First Nation and at West Moberly First Nation told their members, you have to quit hunting these animals. And we have to step back from relying on them and begin to think about how they may need to rely on us. So from that point in time, the relationship has changed. And in 2009, we went to court, West Moberly, trying to stop a mining project that was damaging caribou habitat because a herd called the burnt pine herd was so small that it would be extirpated if that project had proceeded. Uh, that court case and its resolution led to West Moberly saying that they were going to step in and act proactively with some industry partners and some government partners to do what this video shows you. And we've done that for five years. We're now in the sixth year. And with that, I'll be quiet and let them run the tape. Wanna scrub it up a new So far for the caribou pen, we're going into our fifth year. When we came up with the idea to start the caribou pen, it came out of a necessity from a court case, but it also came out from a necessity from the people because we knew that things had to be done to our standard. And when we developed the, the plan for the caribou, it, um, we had workshops and we involved the municipality, we involved um, provincial, federal government, community members from all Treaty 8 nations. And from those workshops, what was plainly, you could see as plain as day, that action needed to happen. There was too much planning occurring in regards to caribou, too much planning as in studies documenting their numbers going down. So First Nations saw that right away, recognized, okay, enough planning, let's do something. So three priorities came out of the workshops and those three priorities were developing a caribou maternal pen, uh, managing the wolf population, and working on habitat restoration. And I believe when I was flying there year 2011 or 12, 
with the helicopter working in the pipeline, we went straight towards Nabish River in the, in the uh, helicopter. We went right across the, the lake and uh, we flew out up that mountain. That's when I, we saw them just in a line like that. They were just, it was terrible. We were walking on the, the ridge. Just lots of them just following each other. They looked beautiful. And I don't know where they were going. I, they were coming kind of east. But they followed the mountains. Eh? Maybe they were going to migrate. Maybe they were looking for somewhere to cross. I don't know. But uh, they, before that, before the Williston was done, uh, they used to cross that field from the mountains, from Nibish River, along way up there, along those mountains. I can't name all the mountains. Just that, just that river. That's what I was told anyway by uh, some of the people that were there. And uh, there's some mountains over there. I believe it would be. Uh, I believe it would be. Uh, uh, a lot of caribou over there because we used a helicopter. We landed by the river, and then, uh, and then, uh, at that time, when the the dam was made was built, they lost their trail coming across the field to go south. So, at that time, when they finished the dam. My dad and them were working still there. It was not finished yet, but they were halfway done at the dam. Those caribou, some of them, odd times, not odd times, quite a few times, they would see a caribou floated to the, to, the, to the river coming this way. They float. They drown because they don't know. If, it's a, if they go across that river, the lake, it would probably take them an hour, two hours to maybe more, to cross that river, because where's their trail? They lost it. They don't know where to, they don't know where to go. Because that's their, that's their migration area, where they travel, and how many, how many kilometers wide is that, that, that Wilson Lake, how, how wide it is for the caribou to cross that river and try to migrate down south. I think it's pretty important because they were disappearing and, and it was pretty well in our culture with the Denisa people and also with the Soto and the Cree people. They used to go and hunt the caribou, they used to harvest them and then when they started disappearing people stopped doing that and uh, I think it's pretty important because the people that stopped hunting them said we can't hunt them anymore because they're, they're almost all gone. So now we're bringing them back. So yeah, it's pretty important. Um, is it our way culturally and traditionally to ensure that the caribou survive? Absolutely, it's pretty important. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're living with uh, the most powerful law on earth. Our people always have lived with, with nature's law. And nature's law means you preserve and you save, you know, for future generations, right? Even, even with hunting and, and trapping, it was all based on uh, making sure that the species survives and continues. Our people never went in there and just killed everything and, and eliminated species of animals. They always made sure that traditionally the, the, the animals that were going to build it back up were, were left alive so they could, they could you know, thrive and, and increase. So this is, um, we, pick in Lycan, we pick lichen bags, so each year we need at least 300 of these bags full of lichen. And it's not just any lichen, they're very specific on what they like. Here's a, a picture of the type of lichen we collect. And they do not eat the pine needles embedded inside. And there's about three different types that we, um, we come across in the field in our area and they pick the species that starts with cladonia. And it's a Latin word for the, the, the lichen.
So caribou eat lichen in the wild. They primarily eat it in the winter time. So it's really important we feed them their natural food when they're in the pen. So the elders actually helped us direct where to go pick. So when we were first um, tasked with the job, we um, looked at our um, land use data within our lands department at our nation. We started talking to elders, asking them where should we go pick caribou food. And they directed us to a specific area. And from there, we did um, field trials where we'd go out before a picking day and start looking for lichen carpets, lichen fields. And then we um, organized children from the local school, which are band members, to do the picking, and also um, a few other community members. So whatever age wants to come and pick, they can. So in total, we pick about 600 of these. They have um, a feeding season when they get in. So when they're first captured in the pen, they eat a bunch of lichen and transition into pellets. So that transition time takes about 300 bags, and there's up to 10 to 12 cows in that period where they transition to pellets. And then once they're ready to release them again, we transition them back to lichen. And that's where it takes another th about 300 bags. So it's, it just depends. The, there's some variability in how many cows there are each year, but it's around that, and it takes us that many bags. We went to court. Um, primarily to, to protect the treaty rights of, of the seasonal round, the harvesting of the seasonal round. Uh, but it turned into this, this um, process of trying to save the caribou. You know, we were, we, once we got into it and started understanding the state of the caribou, we realized that if somebody didn't do something, that the caribou would disappear, you know, which still might be the case, but at least we're, we're in the process of trying to reverse that. In talking with the elders, the caribou were here to help our communities. In times of need, we could always go and get a caribou to eat. We could harvest the, all the parts as medicinal purposes in the caribou. Uh, you know, the hides, every piece of the caribou was used for something. Uh, the bones were used for fleshing tools. Uh, you know, so they're a pretty vital piece of our culture that's disappearing on us. And, and that disappearing, a piece of our culture disappears and we lose a little bit of who we are as, as the indigenous people of the area, you know. And kind of as the caribou are on the endangered list, I think the, the indigenous people here in the northeast are on the endangered list, you know, as, as uh, um, trying to maintain our culture and, and understanding those, those ways of life are disappearing as we lose the elders. And because we haven't been able to harvest the caribou, we've lost all that knowledge that was there with the elders on the caribou. You know, so that's a piece of us. As the caribou disappears, a piece of us that disappears as well. We basically had to say, okay, do we want to help this species or do we want to watch them die? So it was kind of a no-brainer. The community chose, let's help caribou. Let's do our best. Even what I, I believe that the reason caribou numbers have gone down is from industrial development, caribou habitat being eroded, fragmented, a lot of habitat loss. So it is a human problem that created the state we're in now for caribou. So as First Nations people, we are stewards of the land, we are caretakers of the land. We we have somewhat of a responsibility to continue on the life of this species. 
Like, I don't, I don't think any First Nations would say, no, I'd rather let that caribou die. You know, like, I, I just think it's a moral that is within us as First Nations to support and help where we can. And this was something we could do. And so far, it's been successful. Well, I think they're coming back, and I think we're proving it by being really successful with our penning program. I think it's one of the, the very few, and I, th I think it's the only one in North America that it's actually successful, and so we're pretty proud of that program. We are bringing them back, and, and it's just going to get bigger and bigger, bigger and better. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jim. Appreciate that very much. So our next speaker, um, to give us a little bit of an idea on uh, what's happening with the caribou um, today, uh, is Dale Seip. Uh, Dale is a biologist with the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Dale? Okay. So yes, um, so I'm a caribou biologist, work for the BC Ministry of Environment out of Prince George. Been studying caribou in British Columbia a long time, but I've actually been working on these caribou in the South Peace. We started in 2002. So I'm going to talk about the biology and conservation of these caribou. So first off, all the caribou in British Columbia are woodland caribou. So that's a subspecies. So they're all woodland caribou. Now, in fact, all the caribou and reindeer in the entire world are actually all the same species. It's Rangifer tarandus. But that's broken down into a number of subspecies. There's three different subspecies in Canada, but the one in British Columbia is the, uh, the woodland caribou. Now, these animals, however, are further broken down for conservation status and recovery planning. And these are called designatable units, and there's 12 recognized designatable units in, uh, in Canada. And within British Columbia, we have four of them. We have the boreal caribou coming into northeastern BC, sort of north of here and north of uh, Fort, um, Fort Nelson, in the green there. They're nationally listed as threatened. From Prince George south down to the U.S. border, on the east side, or on the west side of the Rockies, we have the southern mountain caribou. So they're not, over, they're not here. In northern British Columbia and into the Yukon, we've got northern mountain caribou. And these guys come right down, including the Graham herd, north of the Peace. But the bulk of the population that we want to talk about here today is this designatable unit 8 here, which are called central mountain caribou. So these central mountain caribou are generally on the east side of the Rocky Mountains, south of the Peace River, and then down to, uh, well, they used to go down to Banff, but the Banff population has been extirpated. The final ones were taken out by an avalanche a few years ago. So we've been studying these caribou, like I said, since 2002. A lot of this work is, relies on radio telemetry work. We capture these caribou, put radio collars on them. The way we catch them is uh, in the wintertime, they're up in the alpine, shoot a net on them from a helicopter. It's called a net gun. You can see the sort of tangled up net there. They get tangled up, uh, wrestle them to the ground, put on the radio collar, and, and let them go. And these radio collars, of course, give us then a great deal of information on the movements of these different animals, the habitats that they use, but also population data. We can find out the mortality rate, what's killing them, how many calves are surviving, and we can use the radio collared animals to assist with our population counts. Because when you go out and count caribou, you're never quite, you obviously aren't seeing them all. 
But by looking at the proportion of the marked animals that you see, you can then correct your census to get a much better estimate of the population. So over the years then, we've collected thousands and thousands and thousands of radio telemetry locations. Uh, the, the radio callers that we use now are, are often GPS callers. They get GPS fixes automatically, transmit that data daily up to a satellite. So you can actually daily monitor these animals. And if they die, they send a mortality signal, and you can get in there immediately and try to find out what killed them. So these are the herds that we've sort of designated then. So starting up in the north is the Moberly herd, or uh, the Jim referred to uh, now often called the Klinzeza herd. Uh, we have the Scott herd in pink, and you can see there's a fair bit of interchange between those guys. We have the Kennedy siding herd, which is primarily on the west side of the Rockies, over towards Mackenzie. This is the burnt pine herd. We then have the quintet herd, and then we have two subgroups of the Narroway, the Bear Hole Red Willow, which is kind of just south of Dawson Creek and, and, uh, and around Bear Hole Lake, and then the South Narroway herd down there. Now, there's actually a fair bit of variation in sort of the habitat use patterns and seasonal use patterns of these guys. Um, what we have here on this map is the dark triangles are actually winter locations. The clear colored circles are summer locations. Commonly what all of these herds do is in the winter time, or I'm sorry, in the summertime, they're far more inclined to be into the rugged interiors of the mountains. That's where their calving range is and their summer range is. But when the winter comes, they tend to move out to the edges of these mountains. So on the Kennedy siding and herd moves off to the, to the west, most of these other herds move off to the east. Now in a lot of cases, they just move out to the eastern edge of the Rocky Mountains. So that's what the Moberly, the Burnt Pine, and the Quintet do. And they're out there on windswept alpine ridges on the eastern edge of the Rockies. In contrast, these two narrowway populations move right out of the mountains and go right out onto the boreal plateau and stay there for the winter and then come back into the mountains for calving. So, you know, even though they're all kind of central mountain caribou and in the same area, depending on which herd we're talking about, you might find them up on these windswept alpine ridges, you might find them in these old growth subalpine parkland forests, or you might find them down on low elevation pine forests. If they're here or here, they're going to be feeding on ground lichens. Here they have to dig through the snow, here they don't. If they're feeding up here, they're gonna be feeding on the arboreal lichens growing in the trees. So we've used this information that we've collected over the years on the habitat selection of these caribou to map the core high elevation habitats and all the other habitats as well. Here's an example. This is the uh, high elevation winter range for the quintet caribou population. You can see we're just uh, west of Tumbler Ridge there. And the green areas that are mapped out there indicate that high elevation core habitat that has the attributes that these caribou are selecting for. When we plot the radio telemetry locations on top, you can see that we've done a pretty good job of really focusing in on those areas that the caribou use. About 95% of the winter telemetry locations fall within these areas that we've mapped as high elevation core habitat. There's a, a, a few, a bit of variation to this. One thing, like, you, like I said, you can see they really are concentrated right out on these eastern edges. They become a little bit more sparse as you get further back into the mountains. The other thing you can see is on some of these areas, they've already been impacted by mining activity and the caribou aren't using these areas. So here we have an area that historically would have had the attributes of high elevation winter range, but this is now the abandoned uh, um, Mesa pit from the original uh, quintet mine. There's no longer any use there. There's also some areas here around the Babcock pit that aren't used anymore. Areas over here around the Bull Moose pit that aren't used anymore. So it looks like you know if you have open pit coal mines up there, you're, you're fundamentally destroying that habitat for the caribou. And there's got to be a limit to how much you can do before these caribou are really going to suffer the consequences. 
So in addition to habitat, I want to talk about the population trend. So again, there's not a lot of historic, scientifically collected population data. Like we, the, the video pointed out, and as Jim has said, First Nations traditional knowledge suggests their caribou were very abundant here. But we're kind of limited to the data that we've got only starting about the 1990s. What we know is by about the 1990s, there was probably somewhere between 800 and 1,000 caribou there. And over the years, as we've been studying them, we've been seeing this precipitous decline. So for example, the Moberly herd, back in about 1995, 198 caribou were counted there. And they continued to decline till they got down into the low 20s, just a few years ago. The Kennedy Siding herd had 120 caribou in 2008. It had declined down to about 50. The burnt pine herd here in orange has been extirpated. It never was particularly big in recent times. There was only about 20 caribou out there, but a few years ago, the last one disappeared. Again, the quintet population uh, numbered 180 to 200 back in 2008. It was down into the low 30s just a few years ago. These guys out here are a little harder to count because they're living in the trees, but doing the best we can, it looks like the bear hole populations declined from about 80, and as far as we can tell, they may be gone. There might be a few scattered out there in the trees, but we don't know that that's any longer a viable population. The South Narrow Way has declined from about 200 down to about 30. So overall, we've seen this decline from 800 or so down to about 200. And if this population trend would have continued, we were projecting that most of these herds would have been completely extirpated somewhere around 2020, you know, can't be totally sure, but they were on their way out. And that's when some population management actions started to be implemented. So what's causing these caribou to decline? Well, like I said, when we go out and we have radio collared animals and they die, we go in, find the cause of death. The overwhelming cause of death that we can identify is wolf predation. So of all the mortalities that we had, 53, 20 of those were due to wolves for sure. We also have quite a few uncertain ones here. So if we just look at the ones that we're pretty certain of, about three quarters of the, of the mortality is due to wolves. This should be no surprise though, because we study these caribou in other parts of BC, including the boreal caribou in northeastern BC, Alberta, Ontario, everywhere people look at declining caribou populations across Canada, there's excessive wolf predation. Now one thing that's a bit tricky about this whole wolf predation thing though is even though wolves are a really, really major predator of caribou and causing the caribou to decline, the caribou are a completely unimportant prey species for the wolves. We can go out and get the food habits of wolves by, again, we've had radio collared wolves out there and we go into kill sites that we find by following the radio collared animals to see what are they living on. And you see they kill some deer and elk and mountain goats and very few caribou, they're primarily sustained by moose. So the wolf population out there, even though it's a big predator of caribou, the actual moose population is what sustains their abundance. And this just makes basic sense from the numbers out there. So if we just take a thousand square kilometers out there, there'd be about 30 caribou. There'd be about 10 wolves and there'd be six, eight hundred moose. So obviously, if the wolves started focusing exclusively on the caribou, they'd be able to clean them up and that's, that's three caribou per wolf. They'd clean them up in a few weeks. So they're really dependent on the moose population. That's what maintains the wolves. And one thing that helps the caribou survive on this landscape is they maintain some level of spatial separation. So we've had radio collared wolves. This is once again out in the Tumbler Ridge area. The green is the high elevation habitat where 95% of those caribou are gonna be in the winter time. And as you can see, the wolves, however, are almost exclusively living in the valley bottoms. They're down there all winter long, 
eating moose, and the caribou are relatively safe as long as that high elevation refuge is in place. The problem is, is come summertime, those wolves start using higher elevations, they're starting to overlap more caribou habitat, and that's when they kill the adult caribou, and that's when they kill the calves. So here we have a, a bit of a, a puzzle, right? I mean, these caribou and wolves and moose and grizzly bears and First Nations hunters and every, all these things used to coexist for thousands of years. Why is it that just in recent decades, all of a sudden, excessive wolf predation is driving these caribou to extinction? And our best understanding of this is that industrial landscape change, modification of the natural landscape sort of flips the tables here and makes the situation more conducive to wolves being able to kill caribou. And there's a kind of a number of mechanisms here. One is that if you go from an area that used to have large extensive areas of old and mature forest, which isn't very good habitat for moose and deer and elk, you're now, once these things start to shrub, brush up, you're gonna get much better moose habitat. Your moose population will increase and as we saw, the wolf population is completely dependent on the moose. And they're going to increase. And periodically, they're going to run into a caribou. And that's what the caribou is going to end up looking like. So we believe this is kind of the mechanism, is that we've disrupted this natural predator-prey system by having industrial disturbance on the landscape, which does a number of things. It allows the wolf population to increase in response to increasing moose populations, but it also just increases the distribution of moose and wolves. And there's roads and corridors. It's just easier for them to move around the landscape to get up into the alpine and kill caribou. And this is a particularly problematic situation because remember we talked about these caribou are primarily living at high elevations here. What it means is that even if we go out there and protect all of that high elevation core habitat, the caribou are still detrimentally affected by what's going on in the valley bottoms where they don't even live. And we see this situation with our southern mountain caribou from Prince George down through Kamloops and Revelstoke. As part of the recovery strategy for caribou there, all the high elevation core habitat is protected. It's basically pristine wilderness and yet the caribou continue to decline, and it's related to the fact that there's ongoing logging in the valley bottoms. Makes it a very, very difficult situation when you have habitat impacts in areas where the caribou don't even live. So that then kind of indicates what are some of the potential management options. And here they are, and the problem with all of these management options is none of them are, are, are kind of very desirable. So the obvious one is we can just do wolf control, and we are doing wolf control. But, you know, there's a lot of public opposition to wolf control. And the problem we have, and as I'll show you in a little bit later, as long as the habitat condition in the moose population is conducive to having a lot of wolves out there, every year they're back in. So it's not a long-term solution. Every year you're going to be having to repeat your wolf control program. A lot of the recovery strategies talk about getting to self-sustaining populations where you don't have to do ongoing predator control. Well, if in fact you simply rely on this, you're never going to get a self-sustaining population. You're always going to have to be prepared to do ongoing predator control if you want to keep caribou there. The second one, and that's what the, the, uh, the, uh, the video was about, sheltering caribou from predators. Basically taking them and putting them in a safe haven. The, the maternity pen, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later, but the idea is to provide them a shelter from caribou for a few months so that they can survive, the calves can survive, and then be released back out into the wild. Again, this is a technique that works. It's effective as a recovery strategy, but it's very, very expensive. It's very, very manipulative of the animals. Every year they're getting captured and put into a pen. And uh, in some places it doesn't work very well. The Clinzizos had actually very good success compared to the other areas. 
you could reduce the moose. Like I said, sorry. What's that? Uh, yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> um, obviously, like these wolves are completely s sustained by moose. If the moose population was driven to a low enough number, the wolf population would decline. That again comes with all sorts of controversy and undesirable consequences that people don't want to have our moose populations driven to very, very low numbers. Ultimately, we could protect and restore that habitat, get rid of all that early serial habitat and linear corridors and start to restore it back to a more natural state. That again would have major restrictions on industrial activity, major socioeconomic consequences of doing that. And if you don't do any of those things, you're by default picking an option that says, well, we're just going to let these caribou disappear because that's the trend that they were on. The only thing that's keeping those caribou out there in recent years is the ongoing wolf control program. So indeed, the government started a wolf control program in this area in 2014. Uh, this is the treatment area. It includes the populations for the Quintet, the Moberly, and the Kennedy siding. It's 18,000 square kilometers in total. Caribou, or the the, the wolves are killed in the wintertime by aerial gunning from a helicopter. Often some pack members are radio collared first to make it easier to find them and make sure that they actually have their territory in this area. And uh, the first year, only 57 were killed. The program was slow to get off the ground, didn't get going till late January. Conditions weren't good. It really, really was pretty ineffective that year, and we didn't detect any effect whatsoever on the caribou. So by taking a fraction of the population of wolves, you really, it's as good as nothing. In subsequent years, the attempt has been basically to kill them all, try to get every wolf out of that area. Next year was very successful, 201 killed. Uh, this shows where they were killed, and the two different colors here are the red numbers here were trapped by the First Nations around the Klinzizaw pen. They were very effective at trapping out the wolves in that local area, but you know, for this widespread area, we, we still need to rely on the helicopter gunning to do it. Again, Though the next year you go out, and even though you've probably killed every wolf out there, the next year there's 100 back, the next year there's 115 back, they just keep coming back in. It's year after year. Now this year, as I understand it, they only sh killed 50, and they're pretty comfortable that that was all that was there, or close to that's all that was there. So it maybe looks like maybe this recolonization is starting to drift down a little bit, but it still needs to be ongoing. And it works. So if we take a look at the caribou response, before wolf control, we were getting about 14% mortality a year. That's down to about five. Calf recruitment was about 16 calves per 100 adults. Now it's up to about 25. The herds were declining by 15% a year. Now they're increasing. So it works. Wolf control works, but it comes with a lot of effort and it needs to be ongoing. Again, we talked about the maternity pen. Again, the idea here is when we catch these caribou in the wintertime and get a blood sample, about 95% of the cows are pregnant. So they're given birth to a calf in the spring. And yet, if we go out normally and do a calf count in July, half the calves are dead. About half the calves are dying within those first few weeks of life. Now, there's been some studies on that, putting collars on newborn calves, and they die from everything. Wolverines kill them, wolves kill them, bears kill them, eagles kill them. They die from accidents. They're just really vulnerable for those first few weeks of life. So the idea is, if we can keep them safe during that time, we'll improve their survival. So these maternity pens, there's been a number, and they tend to be in the range of 7, 14 hectares, not particularly big, built with geofabric, and in March, we go out in helicopters, net gun the care of the pregnant cows from the high elevation alpine habitat, bring them down into the pen. As you saw in the video, they get fed a combination of lichen and some, some pelleted ration. They give birth to their calf and they're held there and finally let go 
in late July when they're much bigger and have a much better chance of survival. So this, in fact, again, contributes to the, 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 uh, the population growth of the herd, albeit a very, very expensive solution. Nonetheless, through the combination of these management actions, we've stopped the decline of some of these herds and turned them around. So the Pine local population unit includes the Klinziza and the Kennedy siding. You can see it was declining precipitously. It was on a trajectory to go to zero, but through the combination of wolf control and maternity penning, it's been turned around and it's starting to grow. These, these, these numbers are year out of date. It's continued to grow into 2019 as well. Uh, the quintet population, again, declining and on a trajectory that would have taken it to zero. In recent years, the past couple of years, we've had better survival and it's turned around and it's increasing as well. Now, I talked about moose reduction, and this has actually been done experimentally a couple times, most effectively in Revelstoke. Here, this is the moose population shown in blue, and they reduced by, just by liberalizing the hunting season. The moose population from about 1,700 down to about 500, and indeed, the wolf population declined accordingly. Uh, there was evidence that the wolves were starving. There was evidence that the wolves were dispersing and going out into other areas, often where they'd then get into trouble and get killed by ranchers or killed by other wolves. So this actually is a technique that can work. The problem with this approach is, in addition to the fact that people often don't want us to be reducing moose, is that the reduction has to be severe. So this was also tried in the parsnip. Just over toward between Mackenzie and Prince George, and they didn't really get a beneficial effect on the wolves because they really didn't bring the moose population down enough. In order to get these, this type of response, you need to get your moose population down to about one moose per 10 square kilometers. This is an incredibly low density, but that's how low you would actually have to get it before you're going to start getting this kind of effect. And then again, ultimately, you know, if we wanted self-sustaining populations and not having to do wolf control, we'd need to have much higher level of habitat protection than we currently have. There is indeed a substantial amount of habitat protection in place in British Columbia uh, through various types of restrictions on forest harvesting, through ungulate winter ranges, and so on. Um, but, you know, it's not enough in, to actually get self-sustaining populations. We have other industrial activities like mining and oil and gas and wind farms potentially going up into these areas. And we also have that problem we talked about that it's not just protecting the high elevation core, it's the whole matrix habitat. So more habitat protection would be the way to get to self-sustaining populations, but the level of constraint on industrial activities to do that would be remarkably severe. The other thing to keep in mind is that even if you were to stop all logging and other industrial activity today, it would take decades for that habitat to recover and you would still have to do predator control or some sort of other population management to keep the caribou in the interim. So that's what I wanted to tell you today and my take home message is we have a variety of potential caribou management techniques, but none of them are, are really easy and simple to implement. All of them are difficult, challenging, socially unacceptable, expensive. It's a very, very, very difficult question is that what's the best suite and mixture of these different strategies to try to recover these caribou populations? So thank you. Thanks very much, Dale, and you'll get a chance to ask Dale some questions in a few minutes. But before we do that, uh, next up for uh, just a brief overview of what the province is doing right now with respect to its uh, caribou recovery programs, uh, Darcy Peel. Can, can everybody hear me? Maybe I'll take a mic. Thank you. Is that better? Uh, so I'll just very briefly talk about the caribou recovery program. Um, 
why caribou are important in BC. We've heard a lot of that already. Um, clearly, caribou are iconic in Canada. You know, they're meaningful. Their habitats are meaningful to the, to the communities that they're around, and uh, you know we we see that in a, a lot of sort of our iconography of, of the country, including the quarter. Uh, also, as we've discussed already tonight, they're they're uh, federally listed species under the Species at Risk Act. Uh, the ones in this general area listed as threatened. As Dale outlined nicely, they require uh, large amounts of contiguous habitat in order to thrive. They're particularly vulnerable to predation by wolves and the changes in predator-prey dynamics that result from industrial use, uses of the land and, and the way we've uh, changed the landscape in particular ways. They're also sensitive to human disturbance in some places. In addition to, to those challenges that the caribou face, they often occur in places that are of, of particular interest to us, whether it's recreation or in, industrial development. They, they rely on, like we said, large tracts of contiguous old forest, which is valuable for forest, forest development. They often uh, are found in areas that are um, valuable mineral, mineral areas, whether it's coal in this area or in other areas of the province as well. And in addition to that, and we've discussed it a little bit tonight, they're, they're significant to, to First Nations and the community, their First Nations history and the communities that they have supported for thousands of years. And so, for those reasons, and, and you know, we fill a room to talk about caribou, and we'll do this night after night after night, these, these issues are important to people. The landscape that they occur on is important to people, and, and the animals are as well. Uh, so back to the map, uh, as you'll see, the caribou that we're specifically talking about tonight are these ones. But there's 54 herds in BC, ranging from the US border right to the Yukon. And they're made up of the Southern Mountain Caribou, which Dale described nicely, the Boreal, and the Northern Caribou. And as you can see on the side here, there's approximately 15, 16,000 caribou remaining in BC. That's down from in, in the neighborhood of 40,000 in the 80s, so down significantly. So in response to the acknowledgement and, and watching that decline happen, uh, the BC government has been attempting to manage caribou and recover caribou in the province for a number of years. There's been a lot of work done Dale's been a part of a lot of that work in, in Caribou for a couple of decades at least. And, uh, and there's been numerous others as well that have collected a lot of information. So we understand Caribou and the, the way they u utilize the landscape in BC and uh, the things that are driving the decline. So in recognition of that, BC struck out on a Caribou recovery program that t took all that information and brought it to a provincial uh, program. The goals and principles, goals and objectives of that program are to recover caribou in identified herds, to provide certainty to the natural resource users, to the people who use the landscape, whether it's for recreation or, or the work that they do, uh, to continue to advance collaboration and reconciliation with indigenous groups, work like the, the work that's happened with the SOTO and West Moberly, with the mat pen and, and other work like that. We want to continue to develop collaboration with communities and, and community partners across the province as well. And we're actively looking for partners in doing that. And I suppose the, the other thing and the, and the reason everyone's out here tonight is 
people want to be a part of this and they want to be heard as to how they can contribute, how they can be involved. And we're here to hear that and incorporate it into the program. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Darcy. Uh, which mic would you like to use, Sue? Um, back to Sue, and she's going to talk about the federal program areas. Thanks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, I guess we need the next slide. How do we do that? Can't push the mouse. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Federal Species at Risk Act, and uh, that is a piece of legislation that's designed to protect and recover wildlife species like the South Mountain caribou. However, that act is really designed to work with provincial legislation that uh, manage uh, uh, a wildlife, and the Species at Risk Act is, was really designed to be sort of a, a last resort. Now, uh, the Act is a very complicated Act, and it's got a lot of requirements, a lot of prescriptive things that, that must be done, and it also has a lot of tools that uh, help recover the species. So, um, uh, we've heard already about the uh, recovery strategy, so that's one of the requirements under the Act, is after you list a species, uh, you must, and it's either endangered or, or threatened, you must actually develop a recovery strategy uh, that lays out what, are, what needs to be done to recover, to protect and recover uh, that species. There are other tools, like the Section 11 agreement, the partnership agreement that we're talking about that are enabled by the Act, so there's a whole range of, of things uh, that can be be used under the Act. But one of the tools is something called an emergency protection order. And that uh, can be used if the minister comes to an opinion that the species is imminently threatened either to their survival or their recovery. And uh, last um, May, uh, the minister of the Federal Minister of the Environment, Minister McKenna, did indeed find that uh, the South Mountain caribou throughout the range um, is uh, imminently threatened to its recovery. Um, and, and in particular, uh, so that finding actually covered the whole range of South Mountain caribou, but in particular it was influenced by 10 local population units, those are individual uh, herds within in that, that range, uh, being of particular concern, and that included some of them uh, that, that we've seen here, uh, the Quintet in Norway. Um, and I should add that um, before the minister came to that 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 uh, decision, she'd been um, she'd received multiple requests from uh, parties uh, to form that opinion. So she was provided with considerable material and and strongly uh, urged to uh, turn her mind to decide whether there was an imminent threat uh, or not. And indeed, she found one. Now, under the law, under the Act. After the minister finds um, that there's an imminent threat uh, to the survival or recovery of a species, the minister is then obligated to recommend an order to the federal co uh, cabinet. Now, an order is like a regulation, and in this case, the regulation, due to the type of instrument that we have, is essentially a prohibition order, which would say, uh, in a certain area, you can do nothing that will harm the caribou or harm the critical habitat uh, to the caribou. That's a pretty blunt instrument. It's only been used a couple of times. Um, so that's, that's what the minister must recommend. But the minister recommends to the federal cabinet, and then the federal cabinet can consider a variety of options of what it really wants to do. It'll take into account what the minister recommends, uh, but it can also look at other options. And it can also consider socioeconomic factors in its decision making. So as we've heard, uh, caribou require more than just um, uh, just a, a prohibition, they were to actually recover, uh, we've heard things like uh, uh, needing for predator control, needing a maternal penning, um, 
needing a restoration of the habitat. Those are kind of things that wouldn't be covered under, um, uh, under an order. There are other activities. So there, there can be a combination um, of things that, that, that could be used to recover uh, the caribou. So I think um, what we're talking about here today, the uh, Section 11 bilateral agreement between Canada and BC, uh, throughout the range of the South Mountain Caribou, uh, coupled with the partnership agreement that we will talk in more detail about. That's one of the alternatives that the federal cabinet uh, could consider um, uh, when, when it's faced with, it, with this decision. So I hope that that sort of put a little bit of the context of the, the Federal Species at Risk Act uh, uh, in terms of why we're here today and what, what the activities and the types of agreements that we're going to talk about. Thanks very much, Sue. Next up is uh, David Muter um, uh, with the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resources Operations. And uh, David will talk to you a little bit about the uh, partnership agreement. I think I'll use this. Can, can folks hear me okay? Is that good? So thank you. So picking up from where Sue left off, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the Section 11 agreement and give you some context and background on it uh, to bring you up to speed on this. Um, so as Sue mentioned, the Section 11 agreement, it's called the Section 11 agreement because it refers to the section within the Species at Risk Act that lays out the ability for the federal government to enter into an agreement with another government, in this case BC, to put forward uh, the, the recovery plan that is going to be put forward for the recovery of a species. And as Sue mentioned, we see this Section 11 agreement as an approach that's a little more nuanced and allows us to access all of the recovery tools for caribou, uh, but also more importantly, puts in place a plan for engaging with communities as part of that Section 11 agreement. So this is a more collaborative, more nuanced, and allows us to access more of those tools. Um, as you can see, it's uh, between uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada and the province of British Columbia. And the Section 11 agreement applies to all Southern Mountain Caribou, and that's the populations that are in each of those little blobs uh, on the map there. Um, we see it as a framework agreement um, uh, that allows for certain elements, and we see the benefits of it as follows. So the benefit of a positive collaborative approach uh, for caribou recovery, uh, as Sue mentioned, it can be considered by Cabinet as an alternative to that emergency protection order. This is a more nuanced approach that includes collaboration in all of the tools available for caribou recovery. Um, it allows us access to federal funding to support the, the Section 11 agreement. It also demonstrates a strong stance on uh, uh, species at risk, recovery of species at risk, again another part of, uh, of uh, solution other than that emergency order. And it better aligns with the uh, provincial caribou recovery program that you heard Darcy speak about. Uh, so this is a solution that fits well with what we have in place in BC and is aligned to the programs we have in place right now. Um, you'll see uh, in the online materials, uh, there's also details in Annex 2 that lays out the specific actions that are envisioned in the draft Section 11 agreement, both what's currently underway and what the other actions that are envisioned to be taking place over the next uh, several months. Um, so that is the Section 11 agreement, and uh, whoops, there we go. I'm going to hand it over to, uh, well, I'll hand it back to David to hand it over to Russ. Thank you. You'll, you'll, you'll be pleased to know it's one more speaker. Um, Starcy uh, LaRoche is going to tell you a little bit about the partnership agreement, which you're probably most interested in because that focuses on the uh, Central Mountain Caribou. Darcy, or Russ. Hello, that's rare. Thanks, David. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about the partnership agreement. Just double check, everybody can hear me fine? Perfect. Um, so as David just mentioned, the Section 11 agreement is the, the broader um, area here in the, in the gray. The partnership agreement is, um, is more in your backyard. It's, uh, it's these orange units here, the Pine, Narrowway, and Quintet population units. Um, and uh, the parties to that agreement are Canada, the, the federal government, uh, provincial government, as well as West Moberly and Soto First Nations. Um, and, and the purpose of that agreement is just to set out the, uh, um, 
The shared objective to stabilize and grow to self-sustaining populations in the central uh, mountain caribou. And so we, we saw that video earlier, it was really good. Um, talked about some of the work that West Mobley and Soda was doing. This is an addition, or this is some of that as well, but but a couple of addition things. And and so the question comes up: Why West Mobley and Soto First Nations, as far as other partners to this agreement? And uh, and this is part of the answer. Um, and and that is that they've really demonstrated some leadership in that area, as far as caribou recovery uh, actions. Um, we we saw about the maternal penning. We talked about the ground predator management. Um, they've done a bunch of planning and research themselves on habitat. And, and they also own, uh, I think, a couple of companies now, actually maybe even three, there's only two up there, um, that, that are beneficial to caribou recovery and related to restoration activities and, and the plant nursery there. And in addition to that, and, and Jim mentioned this earlier as well, um, they've, uh, they implemented a, a self-imposed moratorium on caribou hunting a long time ago, recognizing the, the impact and the decline in the, in the caribou populations. So what is the draft partnership agreement? Um, it's online. I think probably some of you have looked at it. And it's a big document. And these are some of the key items to that agreement. And I'm going to cover these a little bit more, um, a little bit more in depth in the next slide. But the key actions in or key items in the agreement are high elevation habitat protection, um, some other protected areas, specifically in that Clinzeza Mobley area, and uh, establishment of what we're calling the Caribou Recovery Committee, as well as um, some commitment to recovery objectives, land use objectives uh, in other parts of the landscape there. In addition to this, there's, there's also commitments to predator management, um, funding for maternal panning, restoration activity, so a couple other items in the agreement itself. This is a, a busy map, I recognize that, and I, I'm going to be back there a little bit later, can walk through some of this more specifically if you're interested, but I'm going to try to run through it here. Um, I'm going to try to take the time to do it right. But uh, th this is the partnership agreement area. Um, I'm going to start with these green areas here. Um, so these green areas are in that, uh, that Clinzeza area. This is uh, the highway there, Mackenzie, Chetwin. Um, that area is, is right now in that the draft agreement set up for an interim habitat protection area. And so in that area, there would be a prohibition on further uh, approvals of applications for um, type tenures, uh, forestry, mining, those types of things. Um, in addition to that green area is this blue area, which is also proposed as an uh, interim habitat protection area. And this is uh, really linked closely with what Dale was showing us earlier in that, that core critical habitat for caribou. Um, a lot of this is alpine tundra. And uh, this, is, this is key to, to caribou survival um, protection of this area. In that area, there are some forestry operations. There are some mining operations. Um, but largely, those uh, in, in what's being proposed here, um, there's, a, there's an alternate area. And I'm going to talk about that right now. This, this orange area here dispersed through. So that's uh, what we're calling the a sustainable um, activity area. And so it's, it's in the high elevation habitat, but there is some existing tenures there that are in place, and there's room in that area for, for those to continue to, to proceed. In this activity area, there would be use of uh, the Caribou Recovery Committee I, I mentioned on the last slide. So the Caribou Recovery Committee would look at applications in those areas and, um, and provide a recommendation to a decision maker, basically, does the application consider um, the impacts to caribou? Does it attempt to mitigate those impacts to the best of their ability? Um, what are those mitigations? What's the impacts going to be? Those type of items. The committee, which involves membership from Soto, West Mobile, Canada, and BC, would uh, look at those, those impact assessments, mitigation plans, and the application itself and take that information and provide a recommendation to the decision maker on whether they support this application. 
we can talk a bit about that in a, uh, more in a few minutes. So that would apply in that those orange areas here, as well as these areas around here. So what we're calling the B1 area. And as far as the labeling on these, that's that's just for reference in the document if you looked at it. Um, and so that would cover the A1, the B1, the, the two protection areas. Then there's this other area called B4. And it's largely like the other um, sustainable activity areas in that the Caribou Recovery Committee would apply there. The, the different in this area is there would be an extra focus on restoration and conservation. So probably additional funding for restoration activities. Also potentially land use objectives that might guide development in those areas in certain ways that are uh, a little bit more um, sensitive to caribou. And then finally in that area is the, uh, the, this B5 area. And largely that's just an area of uh, identified by West Mobile First Nations as an area of intent for a First Nation woodlands license. There's uh, been a commitment, government's made a commitment to West Moberly in previous agreements to issue a First Nation woodlands license to them. And this has just been an area identified by West Moberly as, as a potential location for that, that license. So we've all been watching the news and social media and, and there's definitely a lot of concern about access to the backcountry. Um, we heard it yesterday loud and clear. Um, I just want to start out by being clear. There's nothing in this agreement that says, uh, says you, won't, you won't have access to the backcountry. There's nothing saying you're, you're not going to be able to go there. Um, what it does say is that the, the parties will implement uh, um, a winter recreation um, engagement process. Now the intent of that is to put in some recreation closures for snowmobiles. Um, it doesn't define where that might be or what that might look like. It talks about starting the process, starting an engagement process. And so our intent is um, probably in May, actually I'm, I'm sure it's in May, um, going, starting a process to start gathering information from the, the recreationists and other community members and users as well as uh, is cross-referencing that with uh, the, the science that Dale would, I'm sure, provide some of that information on, on actual use of caribou as well as other science. And then through that um, and some engagement sessions, much like this, uh, form a, a recommendation to a decision maker to implement some, some snowmobile closures, as you probably heard of in other parts of the province. Um, so that's the intent of, of doing that process. Nothing is predetermined um, in that, but looking at the, the habitat use, that's probably a good starting point to guide where, where those protections would, would start to be considered. And uh, so just to add to that a bit, as far as um, what that might look like, um, one, one thing that, uh, that is an outcome of this is identifying areas for closures, for sure. But also in addition to that is identifying areas to invest in and, and there's a commitment to provide funding to, uh, to improve um, some areas for, for new use or for enhanced use. Um, and so that's a commitment as far as uh, part of this process as well. And, and obviously the outcome here is, is just to provide some direction and clarity to the, the snowmobile um, community and, and, and users out there. David, I think you're up. You taking this one or am I? Okay, and so as far as uh, the next engagement and next steps, so um, we started our engagement uh, yesterday. Um, well, we started it last week with access to the websites and whatnot. Um, through the next month, we're gonna be engaging with communities um, in the Northeast, we want to start here because of the partnership agreement, but uh, also across the province um, on the section 11. We're gonna get a bunch of feedback from, from the likes of all of you in this room through these sessions, as well as going through the, the Engage BC site and also paper copies if, if required. Um, and then the, the, all that information is gonna be rolled up into a report on what we heard. Um, and then through that process, well, that information will help inform the decision makers. So the decision makers for the nations the decision makers for the province and the decision makers for the federal government. We'll take all that information, um, the, the impact analysis, 
uh, what we heard from all the people, and that will help inform the decision on moving forward with these agreements. And then ongoing after this, there's still work to do as far as um, um, more long-term planning in other areas for caribou management um, in the central group and other parts of the province, of course. Hillary, did you want to link that or is that just a... So this is just um, where to find the further information on this. Um, I'm sure most of you have this. If you don't, of course, you can access it there. Uh, I think a Google, Google search of Engage BC Caribou will get you there as well. This is you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Russ. Um, okay, so now it's your turn. Uh, you've uh, been given lots and lots of information over the last hour and a half, and uh, I'm going to use the other, I'll use this. And um, so we've got some great panelists here you've heard from, so you can ask them questions. I, if you're not sure who you are directing it to, um, we'll make sure it gets to the right person. We've got four roving mics, and we're going to start on the right-hand side of the room here, or your left and we'll work our way around. All you have to do is just raise your hand. You can either ask a question or provide some input. So I'll start with this quadrant first. Anybody interested? Yes, sir. So, um, yeah, there we go. Check. Oh. Hello there. Um, my name is Franco Antoniazzi, and I am the regional manager for Canadian Forest Products in this area. Um, I have worked for CAM4 and in the wood industry for 32 years. And as CAM4, we are concerned about the potential impacts of the draft caribou protection agreement. Um, we're, we're frustrated by the lack of industry and community engagement so far. Um, you know, we we are proud employers of the piece. Uh, we have two sawmills in this area, we have two pellet plants, and we have a pulp mill in this area. So we are invested heavily in this area. Uh, we employ uh, 500 plus employees um, in the peace region. The, uh, the uh, annual economic impact in the region for us is $690 million. million. In the last 10 years, um, we have uh, attributed $250 million to this region. So we're invested. Um, we're currently undertaking our own economic analysis to better understand what the impact of caribou agreements means to Camphor and our business because uh, it could be very substantial. But we're very concerned that we believe these arrangements will significantly impact the industry, our employees, and the communities where we live and work in. So we hope there will be more meaningful consultation with our industry and our communities going forward on this file. Thank you. Hello, thanks. Uh, we'll just come back to that in a sec. Just, sure. Uh, Russ, you want to do a quick answer to the... To yes, the so just, just to address that, that comment. Um, so just, just so everybody knows, we have been engaging, and, and not to the degree probably preferred to by the licensees, but we have been engaging with, with the licensees in the, the peace area. Um, mostly West Fraser can for Louisiana Pacific um, as well as BC timber sales um, we've been providing some of the information as it's coming out 
and uh, they have pretty much everything now, I would say, and we are working with them to um, ensure they understand how we are interpreting the data and coming up with our impacts and, and making sure we work with them to reconcile any interpretations they have on that data. So we have been working on it with them. I, I understand it, it sooner would have been better, and, uh, and I recognize that, but it, we have been doing it for at varying levels for probably three to four months now. Um, obviously, more so frequent, more so more more recently. Yeah. Gentlemen, the uh, question on the pipelines. Yeah, yeah. You we get your mic. Go, go for it. As uh, would the pipelines uh, be affected by this? Uh, so uh, I don't actually know. Uh, it's a good question, but uh, if, if I could during the break, we'll circle is back this, on that. Is one that the hurry then for this, or is it uh, to put no, this in place? No. no, but it's a good question as to do pipelines come through that. We'll look at that during the break. Yeah, we'll I think, we'll have a look back. at that and get back to you during the break. Yes, sir. We'll take one more from this quadrant. Uh, my name is Carl Getchuf. Uh, I've been in the Quintet herd for 37 years, and uh, I've already heard some comments, so it spurred some questions. In the last 20 years, why has the government not addressed any of our concerns with regards to the destruction of habitat and the loss of our jobs uh, to industry? when this was pointed out to them time and time again, meeting with district managers, meeting with biologists, uh, trying to work with companies like Canfor and West Fraser to try to save a little bit, because us on the land knew where those animals were. And the government completely ignored that. 20 years of ignoring is what created this situation. I listened to Dale's presentation carefully. He chose his words very carefully. And he's right in what he said. But he didn't expand on all that he knows. The moose population, for example, was at a, at a place in this area where you didn't hunt moose. You went and you shot one. They were everywhere. And the wolf population was nowhere near what it is today. There are no moose today. In the 70s, I was in the Narroway. I ate caribou because there was no moose. So the analogy that was given about moose numbers coming up, predators coming up, you got to reduce the moose and everything else save the caribou, simply isn't true. If you're going to manage wildlife, you have to manage them all. BC has not managed predators for the last 20 years. That's a fact. I can remember a time when you'd hardly even seen a wolf track. And why was that? Because man collectively persecuted wolves all across the world. And we took their numbers down to where we could deal with them. And then the government brought in restrictions. You can't do this. You can't do that. And slowly but surely, these predators responded. You need a 70% reduction in the numbers, reduction of predators to have an effect on them. All we do now is tinker with them. I also disagree with the stats on what's sustaining wolves. Beaver are a big component to their survival. Biomass science has proven that, not just moose. So my question, back to whoever wants to answer it, why has the government done nothing? They announced five years ago $27 million for caribou recovery. If you do the math, it's $2,000 to kill a wolf. If you do the math, it works out to $18,000 allotted per caribou. We're here because we're concerned. You guys are here because your mortgage is getting paid by it. 
So 27 million, where are we today? Anybody want to answer? So thank you for the question, and, and I'll try to address the where we are with the 27 million that was announced uh, back in February of 2017. That money has been utilized to continue to do the caribou recovery work across the province, some of which we went into quite, quite a bit of detail today around the mat pen and uh, predator removal in, in surrounding that area. But there's a number of other projects going on across the province. There's another mat pen, there's habitat restoration work, there's work on uh, collaring caribou and, and uh, predators to understand the predator-prey dynamic with various herds across the province. Uh, I could I could get you d much more detail on that if you if you'd like. Uh, there's been work on lin linear disturbance uh, restoration, and and to address the point about you know how we got here. You're absolutely right that, that we got here through through the 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 way that we've managed the the landscape, and and we're we're reaping the rewards of of uh, of that management on, on caribou. So there is no easy solution here. I think that that's the key we want to get out to people to understand that there's no solution to caribou recovery that you just flick this switch and everything will be good. This requires a lot of action at the front end, an ongoing commitment to recover caribou in order to keep them on the landscape. Okay, we'll come back to you, okay, sir? Uh, a, quick, a quick supplementary. Okay. Moving forward, in response to your answer, I've read your documentations, and uh, under financial arrangements and support, it says clearly that Canada and British Columbia acknowledge and agree that any funding to implement this agreement is subject to their respective priorities and budgetary constraints. That tells me that if something else pops up and they need the money, it isn't going where they say it's going to. The next paragraph says, Canada and British Columbia further acknowledge that neither party is providing assurances to the other party that it will obtain funding or any required approvals or mandates that may be required to implement any conservation or recovery measures. Thank you. Um, so those clauses are in there <clears throat> to uh, assure all the parties that the annual budgeting process that each government goes through to get a vote and allocate dollars to this um, will be essentially protected. Government gets to make their decision around how they're going to invest their budget on an annual basis. Uh, what, we've, what we are saying though, that government has signaled that we have funding for the next five years, or four years now, uh, and it'll probably keep rolling over each year uh, to invest in caribou recovery. But those are clauses essentially to uh, protect each government from uh, uh, what it can commit to in any given year. I'm just kind of say that um, agreements of that nature, those kinds of clauses are pretty standard. I think when you read the the agreement too, it also commits to seeking to find the the funds to do the things that we're committing to in in the agreement. Okay, we're going to move down to the back quadrant there, uh, Brian. Uh, hands in the back quadrant. Would like to ask a question. Oh, right there. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Megan. Yep. 
Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kathleen Connolly. I'm here representing the Dawson Creek and District Chamber of Commerce and the Concerned Citizens for Caribou Recovery. Um, one of the things we're concerned about, uh, we have a letter, two letters that we will be submitting to the committee tonight, uh, is that the Caribou Recovery uh, Agreement started in about 2002 being negotiated with governments. Uh, our concern is that government has said that, the, that really public input ends on May the 3rd, which is just a very short amount of time. Time. The socioeconomic impacts to our region could potentially be devastating. The provincial government has not started a socioeconomic impact assessment for any part of our region today. So what we're asking in our letter is that government uh, extend the uh, amount of time that government and citizens can respond to these concerns, that the regional district can hire legal counsel if they require it, that they can do an independent socioeconomic assessment uh, look at yours, compare that data, and make decisions and mitigation that will actually allow our communities to be able to respond in a manner that will allow them to mitigate for what is going to happen to industry, not only forestry, but mining and the small businesses that will be impacted by it. So our request today specifically is that you extend deadlines and that you allow local government to do their own socioeconomic impact assessment and to retain legal counsel so that they can make the right decisions for our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we will certainly take that and uh, bring it into our decision-making process around the timelines. We do know that there are challenging timelines. Um, we have embarked on working with uh, both Canada, ourselves, and with local government on a terms of reference for an economic impact analysis that we want to do with the communities. We recognize the timelines are challenging. We think we can get a lot done in the time frame that we do have, but I can assure you that uh, the information that we are collecting and that we're going to be bringing back to our respective decision makers will be fully apprised of the economic consequences of any partnership agreement implementation. We had a question over here. Thank you. Um, my name is Roger Roy, and I am the general manager for the West Fraser operations in Chatwin. And I, uh, I attended last night, and thank you for the presentation. I just have a few comments kind of on the same line as last night. Um, we recognize that this process has been going on for a number of months, and uh, I have to say, you know, despite some of the comments, there has been very little industry input uh, into this whole process. Um, it's been restricted to four groups. We all know that. Um, the deadline for submission, just as the, the lady here was saying, is, is very quickly coming at us. And we have yet to see a social economical study completed. I agree with that. And I agree that it is not a simple thing that's going to be done in a number of weeks. And uh, we, we as a company, uh, uh, West Fraser and Chetwin, um, have a $24 million payroll, annual payroll. We've invested $150 million into the Chetwin facility in the last 10 years. We uh, contribute about $34 million annually to the, to the uh, local community of Chetwin, which, by the way, is about 2,500 people. Um, we have 250 direct employees and about 350 indirect employees, and I bet you there's some people in this room that would uh, contribute to the operation of West Fraser and Chetwin. Um, this is a very significant issue for us, uh, and we absolutely feel left out of this whole process. Uh, Chetwin uh, operation has been in, in, uh, in Chetwin, CFI, for, for 43 years operating and is an integral part of that community. In a, uh, in a conversation that Wes Fraser had with uh, the, the, the group in November, I believe, we were told that we would expect, by the government, this is the government's words, job losses in the range of 500 people, which essentially would shut down either the CAN4 or the Wes Fraser operations. 
Um, there's discrepancies still about the, the, uh, the impact of the cut. Uh, originally, we were told around 400,000 cubic meters. Uh, we're now hearing it's around 300,000. Our estimates very quickly, because we're rushed to try to determine where we're going with this, still puts it way over 400,000. Uh, the minister made a comment that he would expect, based on that cut, that we wouldn't see more than a half a shift uh, a loss in production at one of the mills. And obviously, the minister doesn't understand the economics and doesn't understand it's not a linear uh, relationship between cut and operations. Um, so I agree that we absolutely need to be involved in an economic discussion and uh, it can't be rushed. It has to be taken very carefully and considered very carefully by the, the committee. Thank you. Yes, Hillary, there's a pillow right here. Good evening, I'm Henry Bergen. I've lived in this area for 50 plus years, and I've uh, sold logs to Canfor for 40 years. They've been my bread and butter for a community up in Presbyteau. And uh, if Canfor was, was to be shut down, a lot of people would go hungry in this town. How many people would go hungry if we had no caribou? And the moose have been moving down into southern Saskatchewan and around Saskatoon. There's moose there where there's never been any moose before. And this other area is in uh, Sand Hills Park in the southwest corner of Saskatchewan. I got a cousin there who told me about it. So what's the caribou worth to everybody in here? How many would go hungry if Canfor and West Fraser didn't run anymore? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Raise your hand when you're ready for a question. Input? Yep, right here. Sarah, right here. Sarah. David, right back here. Chuck. We'll do this one first, Brian, then we'll go there, okay? I heard a lot of numbers and everything uh, mentioned about counting the caribou since uh, 1979, 1980, somewhere in there. I heard a lot of numbers about caribou, but I didn't hear any numbers about moose, and I didn't hear any numbers about wolves. And just, you know, as we've heard around the, the room here, just wonder why it is, why is that just the caribou that we're concerned with? And if we are really concerned with the caribou, then why are we not counting the wolves then and the wolves now. We didn't hear any numbers mentioned by the panel at all about wolves. We just heard that there was such a thing. Who would like to take that one? Yeah? yeah. Is this thing on? Yeah? Um, well, we do have wolf densities um, in, in two ways. We originally did a radio telemetry study and had most of the packs collared. And then, of course, from the wolf control, we find out how many are there when they get taken out. And, uh, you know, the wolf densities are about 10 per thousand square kilometers. Unfortunately, we have no comparable numbers from like 40, 50 years ago. So there's, there's nothing really to compare it to. So, but what we know is those numbers of wolves at 10 per thousand square kilometers is more than an, a caribou population can sustain. So those wolf populations need to be reduced if you're going to have caribou out there. Um, there are ongoing moose population estimates. I, I'm not directly involved with that. The uh, Fish and Wildlife Branch here in Fort St. John regularly do periodic uh, moose surveys in different areas. And uh, there's people here today that you could probably talk to and get some feeling for the, some of the trends, recent counts. So, is that okay? Okay, Brian, back there. Thanks. Hi there. My name is Chris Addison. Um, so I have a, have a couple of comments and a, and a question, I think, at the end for Dale. Um, for, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here because this isn't your problem. You didn't make this as public servants. What's happened is that caribou have suffered from a lack of, a lack of leadership at the political level for 50 years. Um, not uh, you know, in the last five or 20. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and I've been involved in this caribou question for about 25 years, most of my life. 
all caribou recovery is about reducing predators one way or another. Whether you're talking about direct removal, reducing moose, or restoring habitat, you're talking about fewer predators on the landscape over time. That's something that everybody needs to get comfortable with, if that's what we're doing. Um, and then uh, one other thing that's happened in this region that hasn't so much in other regions is that we had a predator control program here for decades, going back to about 1904, we had a predator control branch of government and their job was to kill predators. And they killed, it. They killed them very, very well, especially after the Second World War. That produced the, the ungulate populations that we saw in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, where caribou and moose were living in the same landscape because there weren't very many other, um, uh, very many other things that eat them. Um, Dale talked about um, habitat adjacent to core caribou habitat being important as well. I'd like to keep in mind, uh, we have an area in this region called the Muskpaka Chica Management Area, which is exactly that. Um, very little habitat disturbance within it, but we're still seeing caribou declines. And that, I think, is a factor of the predator control work where, where we're seeing an ecological rebalancing of, of, of the area after the predator control work. And then, it, then the question for Dale, is um, when we talk about reducing moose, um, and uh, you showed the numbers from, from the Revelstoke program where we had seen uh, a reduction in the numbers of moose and a reduction in the numbers of wolves, have you seen a response in the caribou population in that? In uh, the Revelstoke situation, that caribou population was declining and following the moose reduction and the coincident wolf reduction, the caribou population stabilized, stopped, in, stopped declining, but didn't recover. So it was enough to sort of slow the decline, but it wasn't enough to do the recovery. So since that time, they tried a maternity pen, which wasn't very successful compared to the Clinzyza. And there's now active wolf control on top of that to, to try to start bringing them back. So, you know, in, in many cases, a, a real mixture of different population management techniques need to be, to be brought to bear. Other questions at the back? Yes, this gentleman right in the middle, uh, Sarah or, or Brian? Chuck. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is John Gibbons. I'm the Woodlands Manager for Canfor in Fort St. John here. And I, I guess my question is for you, Dale, and uh, thank you for your informative presentation tonight. Uh, it was very good to see the caribou population numbers increasing with, uh, with the predator control that's in place. Um, it, you know, given that, uh, you know, one of the main strategies being proposed by these agreements is, is habitat protection, and sort of by your own admission, that's, a, that's kind of a long run, you know, decades, uh, a process that will take decades to produce results. I, I would just like to pose a question to the panel. Uh, what, what is the rush, guys? You know, there's, there's very tight timelines for feedback. Uh, communities and industry have not been involved in these discussions. You know, the caribou, populations are trending in the in the right direction so they are not at imminent threat provided that we continue doing predator control and the measures that you're proposing will take decades to implement so if this is really about caribou uh, you know the caribou populations are okay for now with predator control the measures will take decades to implement so why the rush? Why only one month to provide input on something that will impact so many people in this area? I think I'm gonna let them respond. So thanks for the question. Um, I mentioned when I spoke that uh, the minister uh, made a finding of a uh, imminent uh, threat and uh, yes we are seeing some cautious recovery there in in a couple of the the populations but you know there's a long ways to go but when the minister made that finding uh, uh, it's it's 
that tool is for the situation of a uh, uh, an emergency situation, and so uh, the the intent of the act is that she would move quickly to make her recommendation to to uh, the cabinet. So you know, a year is coming up now. I think that's kind of getting past kind of the quickly um, uh, uh, time frame. Uh, so uh, there will. There will be a desire to have a discussion uh, uh, about what the options are uh, in the in the near future. I think. I mean, I think a lot of this conversation is going to go on for some time as we work through uh, the various aspects. But uh, because I'm encouraging you to provide your input now, recognizing that we don't have all the information, but provide that input now so that we can take it to our our cabinets for them to consider about what the next step is. Yes, yeah, at the back We have there. quite a few questions in this quadrant, just so you know. Hello, I'm Gary Adolph. This is a third generation issue that's gone on in my family. Um, I have not heard about the Gacho uh, caribou that you guys have done. The studies back in the 80s there, you guys hired college students to go in and do counts, and you never brought in any trappers or outfitters to do this. And you guys went in in five years, you counted 80 caribou. You brought in Trembling Pine Outfitters for one week. They counted 2,500 caribou. So I want to know where's the uh, people involved in these studies. They know that flying around in helicopters does not find your caribou. These are studies that have gone on before. Um, and in 512 there, you guys shut down that area completely to everybody else other than by horseback. That area has declined in caribou. It has declined in moose, and you guys have not dealt with the issue then. So my question is, in comment, you have these studies and you've seen what has happened. How come these haven't been brought up and why are outfitters and trappers not brought into this? So, so the question is relating to uh, local involvement and in particular local involvement in the West Chilcotin caribou I think that captures it correct is that correct yeah. uh, so local involvement it's certainly a part of our hope as uh, as a described on the slide and maybe not in enough detail I could certainly go into a lot greater detail about what I'd like to see in the program uh, around involvement with communities, whether it's uh, Anaheim Lake, uh, Risky Creek, Williams Lake, people that are living out on the land there, we want those people to be partners in caribou recovery. Um, with the specific question with the Ilgacho, uh, well with the Itchy Ilgacho caribou herd, that's a particularly challenging chunk of ground that had a, a thriving uh, caribou population through the 80s, through the 90s, and into the 2000s, with recent population in that herd of, of close to 2,500, like the gentleman mentioned. Uh, it's also an area that's seen significant uh, mountain pine beetle infestation. The resulting forest harvest that came along uh, after that and then uh, followed by giant fires in that area. And in addition to that, uh, we've had the, the, the decline in moose populations and significant horse, feral horse populations in the area and cattle on the landscape, which all help to support high predator densities. And some of our initial predator densities in that particular area that we've started to, to look at over the last couple of winters have been extraordinarily high. I don't have the number in front of me right now, but we have callers on wolves out there now to, to, to better understand that. And, and that particular area is a focus of the, of the program for moving forward. So if you'd like to talk some more about that, uh, grab me at, one, at the break or, or after the session, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about it. Okay, thanks. What I, we'll do with this gentleman first, then we'll go over to you, Hillary, okay? Thank you. Uh, Barry Hall and North Peace Rod and Gun Club. I still or would like to echo some of the comments the other folks here about what's the rush. And I need to refresh your memory because apparently it isn't very good. Uh, we had a meeting here on March the 28th of 1918 
or 2018, where you promised a structured decision-making process on this caribou issue. You never followed up on that. So I think if there's any pressure that you're feeling, you deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, we are all talking about the wolves being the number one predator here. There's a lot of us that live in this back country here, and I've been my whole life here. 59 years running around these hills. Grizzly bear numbers are higher than they've ever been in history. Alaska is recognized they had a problem. They have a similar situation going on. Their calf numbers are in the toilet. They have no calf recovery. So they done a study where they collared 40 bears, had cameras on them. In 45 days, on average, they killed and ate 34 calves each. That study is, can be reached by anybody online. If you want to look it up, it's, it's fact. We have never done that study here in BC or in Canada that I am aware of. Um, if you take 5,000 of them bears, and they're inland grizzly bears, and they only kill 30 calves in a whole year, that's 150,000 calves. Those numbers are real. And that's not the only predator. Our black bears, our big cats, cougar, wolverine, coyotes, are all playing a factor in this. And the calving grounds for these caribou is so important because it is up in the grizzly bear's home. We need to address that as well as what else we're addressing here. Or we're all, it's not just our caribou. Our numbers are in the toilet right across the board on everything. And I make my living in the back country like many others in this room. It's our home. I'd like to hear what somebody's got to say on that. Who wants to take that one? Darcy? Or Dale? Yeah, I'll, t I'll try. It's, it's on? OK. Um, yeah, there's absolutely no doubt that you know, grizzly bears are significant predator on moose and, and caribou. They're not as significant as, as the wolf predation is. Uh, you know, we've, we've got the numbers, uh, like I said, about 75% uh, of the adult mortality that we had of radio collared caribou was due to wolves. I don't know the, remember the exact number, but you know, 10 to 15% of the additional was, was grizzly bear mortality. And they certainly kill calves but probably just for the first, relatively first few weeks of life. Um, the other thing is, if you do the calculation like you just did, you, it would show that even though grizzly bears might be a fairly significant predator on calves, in reality, most bears never kill a calf, because if they did, they'd kill every calf out there and there'd be no caribou left after one year. So when you actually do that calculation, what you find is, probably only about 10 or 15 percent of the grizzly bears out there actually kill a calf each year. So, you know, any type of, uh, if, if one wanted to propose grizzly bear reduction, you'd be killing lots of innocent bears that weren't, wouldn't have killed a calf anyhow on the off chance of trying to get the one that, that's going to. So, I mean, I'm not sure why that, that's funny. I mean, that's basically, that's simple arithmetic. There's actually way more bears out there than there are caribou. So obviously, most bears don't kill a caribou or there'd be no caribou left within you know, the, the first year. You'd have to kill like half, three quarters of the grizzly bears Yeah, true enough, but that's not actually the issue here right now. We're talking about whether it would be legitimate to try to do that. The point remains, we know that wolf control on its own is an effective way of turning around these caribou populations, and that's sort of the one that's most practical and most feasible to do at this point in time. All right, we're going to take a question over here if that one's done. Thanks for waiting. Hi, my name's Wyatt Soule. I'm 
owner or part owner with my parents and my now my son for three generations. So 40 years we've been in the rental business. Um, so I kind of grew up here. I, my mom and dad walked across the rail bridge when I was nine months old, so that was 59 years ago. But um, it's obvious the wolves are the issue. Um, at the same time, there used to be a wolf kill program because I was up in Fort Nelson curling when, um, what was the girl, the, the anchor that went up to follow Paul Watson as he went 50 yards in the bush and camped in the cold Fort Nelson weather to stop the, the wolf kill program that was going on? That was how many years ago? Anyhow, Pam, Pamela Wallen, yes, I remember that. We were curling up there at the time. Um, so government has dropped the ball on letting us kill wolves. Now you're going to put a sledgehammer and uh, stop, stop industry because it's always industry's fault. Whenever you deal with wildlife, it's always industry's fault. Well, we all got to live. We all got to make a living. We all got to pay your taxes so that you guys can have a paycheck. And we need to go on with that. But I, my, my point is, is the wolf kill program just needs to be expanded. The reason you're getting more wolves every year is they're flooding back in because you're creating a void. All the wolves around these areas that you're now killing wolves just slide into where there's no, no other deals. And I think you could probably attest to that, the biologist, I guess. The other thing that seems weird about this whole situation is we have two sawmills in Chatwin thinking about closing over allowable cut and we're, we're expanding the timber license for the natives. What is the deal with that? That's the elephant in the room. Um, we're going to shut down existing mills, and to my understanding is the natives don't have a sawmill. Anyhow, so that's the elephant in the room. We're, this is why people are upset. No one will say it because it's not politically correct. But it is the elephant in the room. Most, there's a lot of contractors around town. They don't get a contractor unless they have a native partner. And we're okay with that. But some businesses need to survive without a native contractor as your partner. And who does the work? Anyhow, thank you. Okay. Cool. Want to say something, Russ? I would love to. Go ahead, Jim. I'll respond to part of your question. You're right. There are two sawmills in Chetwind. Now, I've been around here since about 1980 doing what I do, which is policy work, social impact assessment, negotiations, and consultations between First Nations government and industry. I've got a long memory. Back in the mid-90s, we were engaged in a policy dialogue that was focused on what was called mill rationalization. And mill rationalization was a strategy that would get the major mill operators to sit down and talk to each other because in almost every resource town across the north, there were several mills competing with each other, both for fiber and for market. That fell flat on its face. And what happened after that, from a First Nation perspective, is that we've seen year after year of increases to the annual allowable cut, and we've seen movement of forest companies with provincial government approval higher and higher into the mountains and up into the subalpine habitat of species like caribou. Now, Dale has explained that from a biology perspective. And he, he's been very clear to tell you that, yes, wolf predation is the problem. But if industry had never been allowed to go up into the subalpine forest that are important for caribou habitat, we wouldn't have a problem. So that's part of it. 
Now the second part of it is yes, Soto First Nation and West Moberly First Nation either have negotiated a First Nation woodland license or are negotiating one with the government of BC. But we do not intend to harvest timber within those woodland licenses. Our negotiations have focused upon the development of a conservation management regime where we're hoping that the government will provide us with a revenue stream that is based on the carbon offset value of the timber that we don't harvest because we are interested in protecting habitat for animals and helping to restore the forest. So before you speak about First Nations, try to understand what their intent and objectives are. We're not trying to put anyone out of business, but we're trying to rebalance this relationship between industries like forestry and wildlife values that are important for our culture. So I'm, I'm done, and I'll let anyone else who wants to speak to this go ahead. Russ, did you want to speak to that? No, it's good. Okay, so what we're going to do now is, uh, I think everyone's deserved a, a 15 minute break. There's coffee there. Um, there's also posters on the side. Our resource people are going to be readily available, so you can capture them individually. Then we'll come back and get some more input. So we'll see you back in about 15, 20 minutes.